The issue with Lend-Lease is that it can have a bit of controversy to it uh, on part of the Western allies, the United States and, and the United Kingdom. People often try to exaggerate the contributions, making it seem like uh, they had a more a disproportionate contribution to the war effort. Whereas in the Soviet side, it's the opposite side of the spectrum. They tend to use the casualties inflicted on the Germans on the Eastern Front as testament to their overwhelming disproportionate contribution to the war effort. And there is a bit of truth in both of these sides as I want to dispel the myths in this uh, lecture series. I wanted to try something less formal, more organic. So without further ado, um, here we go. So in this lecture series, I wanted to touch up first on an overview of the Lend-Lease, uh, when it generally started, how it started, and the trade flows um, in the different sectors of Russia and how it developed in terms of uh, the deliverables of uh, the, the the Lend-Lease Aid. Next, I'm going to be touching on the Soviet perspective, meaning I'm going to be touching on the main arguments as to why uh, Soviet scholars or Russian scholars believe uh, Lend-Lease did not play as, as, as such a significant eff, uh, effort in the, uh, in, in the war, it did not play such a significant part in the war. Um, so I'm going to give them those uh, different reasons to that. Now after that I'm going to touch on the allied perspective which is generally the opposite because I'm sure a lot of scholars know that the US couldn't have won the war without the Soviets however this perspective tries to downplay that by saying that oh um, but you couldn't have won the war without our supplies that's sort of general thinking so that's going to be the allied perspective and finally, the military implications, which are mainly from a Western perspective, is going to be introduced, mainly involving the great offensives of 1944, such as Bagration and the lvov sandomirsk offensive. So now, overview of Lend-Lease, we can see that it started first as loans. Uh, generally, the Soviet Union wanted to get low-interest uh, loans. Um, on Lend-Lease products because they didn't want strings attached from conditional offers of aid such as trade liberalization or restructuring Eastern Europe after World War II. They didn't want to be pressured into that sort of uh, a position so they preferred to do uh, low interest uh, loans uh, probably with a longer maturity so they can be able to maintain the government to debt ratio. Um, but however, the war effort got really bad by November, as you can see, Operation Tycoon and the start of the Battle of Moscow. So the U.S. decided to switch to trade credits, which are kind of like an elongated loan. It's the same principle as when you get a student loan from the U.S. government, and they don't really care how frequent you, frequently you make your payments as long as you sort of make your payments, but it's not in structured intervals like a normal loan. So in 19, uh, in November 1941, they gave the Soviets uh, more leeway on that. However, in February 1942, at this point, by this point, the United States had entered the war because of the bombing of Pearl Harbor in December 7th, 1941. So they came up with a consensus with the UK uh, master agreement which was a, an offer of conditional aid to the Soviet Union on, uh, in uh, Lend-Lease. Uh, this usually involved, as I said previously, trade liberalization, probably involving Bretton Woods, the advent of Bretton Woods uh, trade system post-war, also involving um, the restructuring of Eastern Europe, uh, probably the dynamics of like who would control what, uh, communist uh, puppets, I'm not sure if they were discussed. I didn't really look into the master agreement. Um, so the structure of the Lend-Lease uh, aid was at first firepower, um, generally up to 1942, 
uh, it was mainly firepower and armaments that were supplied. And only until 1943 did you see a transition more to industrials and consumables, especially consumables, especially um, industrial equipment, raw resources, motor vehicles, a bunch of logistics, communications, that not, whatnot. Also, at this point in 1943. Uh, Canada joined uh, the Lend-Lease program, even though their contributions were a lot smaller. So the reason with this video is generally because with the declassification of Soviet archives, ar archives and the dissolution of the Union in 1990, 1991, you've gotten a lot new data and a lot new information that tells a story, not necessarily from a Western perspective, but it gives a, a good grasp as to the extent of fudging that the Soviet Union did in their own statistics. So it's a good confirmation. Also, it gives a new perspective because with this declassification of Soviet archives, uh, scholars have been able to estimate that about 30 to 40 percent of heavy, heavy and medium tanks during the Battle of Moscow, which is this picture right here, um, were British supplied because the British were the ones mainly supplying armaments at this point. The U.S. contributions weren't necessarily big because of the isolate, uh, isolationist uh, attitudes that the U.S. public wanted. So this was early December 1941 when it reached to 30, 40 uh, percent heavy medium tanks in an entire operational sector, which is quite impressive. Now with the trade flows, we can see generally how Lend-Lease uh, developed throughout the whole war. At first it started um, with co Allied convoys in the North Atlantic to Murmansk and Arkhangelsk, favorite routes of the Entente in World War I and the Russian Civil War, but I digress. So this was about 23% uh, of the total volume of Lend-Lease deliverables. Afterwards, in uh, I, I believe August 1941, I could be wrong, uh, the British and the Soviets staged a joint invasion of Persia. And here, this opened a longer but safer corridor into the Soviet Union to deliver about 24% of the total uh, vol trading uh, volume of the Lend-Lease. Now, after the U.S. entrance into the war, um, the Allies saw it much safer to just do the Pacific route through Vladivostok, uh, Yakutia, Eastern Siberia, and um, Sakhalin, this general region. This is where the overwhelming percent was about 47%. Sorry about that. Um, as, as well, about 55% of all motor and industrial and petrol deliveries were between 1944 and 45. So this demonstrates uh, the transition from armament uh, deliverables in 1941 and 42 to industrial and logistics from 1943 onward. However, please keep in mind that the peak deliverable rate was in late 1943. That's very important uh, to demonstrate um, uh, in later slides why uh, Lend-Lease was important. The Soviet perspective on Lend-Lease is uh, quite complex, even though it can be straightforward. It, it, it has um, the uh, logic that the peak deliverables were not achieved until late 1943 and by then the strategic initiative was already set in place such as the Battle of Kursk, uh, the Battle of Stalingrad, the Battle of Moscow. Uh, by then the German army had incurred serious defeats and blunders, 6th Army. Um, even then the limited success of the third Battle of Kharkiv by Erich von Menstein was met by equal uh, failure in the Battle of Kursk and the Kursk salient. Plus, at around this time, the Soviets, I believe, were reaching the Dnieper, so they were already advancing quite, quite far. And the Riazov uh, salient uh, 
was uh, destroyed. Um, so this removed the immediate threat of uh, to Moscow, and by then um, the Soviets were around Smolensk. Soviet GDP uh, was only 70% 70 70 of Germany's for most of the war, yet Soviet armament production eclipsed Germany's war industry from 1941 onward. This is quite a paradox. Um, this could be explained by the multiple fronts that Germany incurred during the war. However, yes, gross domestic out, uh, product of the Soviet Union was in fact lower than Germany's. It was actually lower than Great Britain's as well, and far lower than the United States. However, paradoxically, it was much, it had a much uh, more mature um, armament industry, as you can see right here, uh, 1941, if you compare the rifle and carbine figures, they shoot up exponentially in 1942, and that's the same with machine pistols, uh, machine guns. In virtually every category, the Soviets start outproducing the Germans. Um, now, here, as you can see, uh, people might say that the reason the Soviets, um, the GDP was lower than the Germans from 1942 onward was precisely because a lot of Soviet territory was occupied by the Germans. However, if you look at 1941, before the uh, advent of uh, Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union, you'll see that German GDP was actually still much bigger than uh, Soviet gross domestic uh, product. And the reason for this is because an overwhelming proportion of the Soviet uh, industry was focused on armament production. The last five-year plan which uh, ended prematurely in 1941 was actually uh, focused on armaments so a lot of the labor force in the Soviet Union uh, was in the armaments industry so that being said another statistic that's quite interesting is that only four percent of the total US UK war expenditures went to the Soviet Union that's quite a small number if you think about it, only 4% of what the US and the UK uh, spent in the war effort went to the Soviet Union. It actually also received less than a quarter of the total expenditure. However, it should be said that proportionally, this wasn't out of the ordinary. Um, the US offered <coughs> a similar uh, proportions to to the UK because the UK economy was actually bigger than the Soviet economy at this point. So now with raw materials production and labor, we'll get the figures on raw materials because this is a subject that a lot of people talk about, especially in the Western perspective. It's called the building block theory that stipulated that um, the Soviet economy was divided into several sectors and without any of those without any one of those sectors it would have pretty much collapsed and it was seriously lacking in raw materials so it allowed the soviets to specialize more in armaments and uh with a comparative advantage and just specializing in one field that's that's part of the western perspective so the u.s outproduced uh, most other powers in most resource categories, especially coal, iron, copper, and oil. Oil is quite important. Um, T.I.K., uh, another YouTuber, he did a great video on oil production in the Second World War and pretty much why the Germans lost. <coughs> German, the German Reich also outproduced the USSR in uh, coal, lead, and zinc, uh, which is actually curious it's it's quite uh expected um but here is the catch the ussr maintained at much higher production in nickel bauxite manganese ore and oil than germany and as you can see here this gives a an idea that the ussr was actually quite self-sufficient uh during the time they even though it didn't have a higher gdp than germany 
it did have a general, generally higher raw materials production and a higher armaments production than Germany. So this probably means that the German economy was still quite consumer oriented until the very late war, whereas the Soviet economy from the get go, I guess because of the gravity of the situation, was totally mobilized. So even though Germany had a higher inflow and outflow of uh, production in its economy, a lot of it was not in armaments. So this goes back to the idea that 50 hour work weeks were common with overtime. This shows the immensely amazing worker productivity that was found in the Soviet Union uh, due to the centralized nature uh, because it allowed total economic mobilization um, <clears throat> of the union. The sad thing was only one day was given off every month uh, to workers, so it was quite grueling and authoritarian in a sense. If you, there are stories if you didn't meet your, your quotas, you'd go to the gulags, but that also shows the intensity and gravity of the situation that was found in the first uh, six months of the Now we're going to switch to the Allied perspective to give it a bit more of an objective and balanced view. Um, in 1947, the Soviet wartime planning chief Nikolai Vosnesensky uh, vaguely stated that Allied aid amounted to 4% of domestic Soviet production from 1942 to 1943. So this seems quite minuscule that only 4% of domestic Soviet production was well, only Lend-Lease lend was only 4% of domestic Soviet production. That's quite small. However, there's a problem with this date because, well, if, as you can see, the UK, you know, GDP was actually bigger than the USSR throughout the war. So first of all, not much aid was being going to be over, over given to the USSR because the UK GDP was actually much bigger so they needed more aid proportionally um, but the, the, the thing um, that intrigues me as I said before both economies were in parity before Operation Barbarossa but here's the catch right here the Soviets actually imposed duties and tariffs on aid so they imposed import duties on conditional aid which strikes me as bizarre so essentially they were taxing the US and the UK who were giving them pretty much free stuff because they wanted to raise uh, more revenue in their treasury in order to uh, spend on war expenditures. So this actually deflates the contribution of the allies because it doesn't take into account the tariffs put on the aid. <coughs> also, peak deliverables were in late 1943, as I mentioned a few slides before, not in 1942, which this accounts for the year of 1942. It was in 1943, late 1943, when the Lend-Lease actually reached its full potential. So this is a bit dishonest of a quote from uh, the chief Nikolai Voznesensky. This is probably why he got shot in 1950, but Sorry about that, a bit sick. So here's the real GDP and resource contributions. Here is what this video is all about. This is the takeaway of the video. So the Germans occupied uh, a lot of land in Russia, especially the um, black soil areas, which are in red. Not all of them, but they occupied generally this whole bit here. Black soil, if you do farming, which I have, um, when soil uh, is tilled too much, it becomes very hard and it becomes quite blocky and it's very hard to plant seeds in blocky soil. It has to be quite soft to, you know, to, to make it like, uh, you know, compact and whatnot. Blocky, it's like you can't put a seed in a block. Anyway, black 
soil is really good because it's quite highly fertile and it's generally very soft. So even if you till it, it's generally quite soft. So you can put seeds again and it won't be that much of an effort. You don't have to put water and irrigate it so that soil can become uh, less compact. So the Germans occupied much of the black, um, black earth uh, areas, especially in Ukraine, Moldova, and in the Cuban in uh, late 1942. And this created shortages and in that in turn also created inflation to the point where in Rostov on Don, which is right here in prime black earth country, um, a kilogram of butter cost you about a thousand rubles. So <clears throat> for the domestic economy, these shortages in consumable, in consumable goods was creating a bit of a crisis um, and the lend lease what it really did um, it helped alleviate uh, domestic uh, resource uh, production so this is the catch it is estimated that lend lease accounted for 14 percent of uh, total resources uh, pretty much in the, in the soviet union that were produced in the soviet union that is quite a significant alleviation um, and also 16% of the gross domestic product of the Soviet Union. This was an estimate by, I believe, Mark Harrison from the University of Warwick, um, because this accounts the grossly inflated import duties that also counted as war expenditures. This accounted the peak deliverables rate in late 1943 of lend lease. So, all in all, I'm going to finally touch on the military perspective, which is mainly from a Western point of view, as I said, about why Lend-Lease is necessarily quite important. Because in Bagration Lvov Sandomirsk offensives of late 1944, you saw this wide sweeping uh, staggered offensive that took an incredible, uh, incredible amount of organization. Deep battle as a doctrine was quite ambitious and required such a staggered information to allow for confusion and the exploitation phase, as I've said in uh, another video. But in order to have to, for this to be accomplished, you needed uh, an appropriate amount of communications equipment, you needed an appropriate amount of motor vehicles, appropriate amount of rail lines, locomotives, and whatnot to keep um, the supplies from reaching the front. That was a problem for the Operation Bagration because it actually stalled um, in Poland um, around, I believe, August or September 1944, simply because the transportation arteries that were keeping it going were completely exhausted. Now, without the um, motor vehicles supplied, um, disproportionately supplied by lend -Lease, uh, such an offensive would have been impossible to make. The Soviets would have d made a breakthrough and they would have been pushed back or they could have been isolated. Now, I'm not arguing that they couldn't have won the war, but in my personal opinion, they would have probably reached reached a truce with Germany, as I said in the deep uh, battle video. They would have reached a truce because there's only, they've already they'd already sacrificed too much. Uh, David Glantz here estimated that an extra 12 to 18 months of war would have occurred without lend lease, which would be staggering. That would be a, another few million Soviet losses. And by the time the Soviets had reached Berlin, they'd already exhausted a lot of their manpower. They were having manpower shortages at that point. So imagine for another year. Now, the Germans were in the same situation, but it's just to give a bit of perspective that it would have been incredibly difficult to do these deep penetrations. It would have taken Stalin a lot more patience of making limited uh, offensives and counteroffensives, which he was not famous for, but neither was Hitler. So that could have led to more military blunders like Operation Mars and uh, the 
uh, aftermath of the Third Battle of Kharkiv. So, to give perspective, Lend-Lease gave 10% of all tanks. All tanks in the Soviet Union, 10% of them were Lend-Lease tanks. 12% of all aircraft in the Soviet Union were Lend-Lease. 57% of all rails, which is incredibly important for the transportation ar arteries of such a vast country, uh, employing such a mobile battle doctrine. 57% of all rails were Lend-Lease. And finally, 58% of total aviation fuel, probably because in the US uh, they had better quality, more refined fuel, was Lend-Lease. So this offers a perspective of it really did contribute in, in a way that it deserves some merit. Now that's not to say that the uh, Soviet armaments industry wasn't mature because it absolutely was, but it also is to say that Lend-Lease deserves some, a, a bit of, uh, it has some credibility to it. It deserves a bit of respect in terms of speeding up the war by a lot. So in conclusion, the takeaway of this video is that I think Westerners and uh, Eurasians shouldn't be fighting, especially when they were fighting a war against uh, such a cruel regime. I mean, you could say the same for Stalin, but the um, difference with Stalin is it wasn't really necessarily biological like uh, the, the Nazi regime, but um, I think we should take away from this to be friends, to understand each other in terms of our contributions. The US didn't just let the Russians die uh, while they sat doing nothing. That's absolutely not true. Uh, but it's also um, not true that uh, the Russians pretty much held the mantle of the entire war. Um, so it's just to go to, to say that cooperation comes a very long way. So thank you everybody for listening and I hope to hear you all next time. Bye.